Okay, great. Okay, so you all can see my screen. So my name is Elena Fordham. I'm the founder and principal of Beverage Marketing. Uh, and today's topic is Content Marketing 101 for your business to consumer brand. So just very quickly, a little bit about our team. Um, we are we are a team of three women, and then we have you know some junior people working with us. We so again, Elena Fordham, founder and principal. I've got 15 years experience in marketing, public relations, and event management, um, spanning professional services, AI, technology, and startups, clean tech, uh, nonprofit. I've also done a lot of work in like hospitality, fashion, and retail. Um, and one thing we've even done is we launched a, a, a schedule one bank in Canada. So we've have, you know, we have quite a range of experience and we try to take that experience and transfer it to all our clients and kind of share the learnings because a lot of things we do in marketing are you can transfer the skills um, and the uh, strategies. Katie Zepieri will be joining us later. Um, she joined me recently. She's incredible. She's an our account supervisor. She's a communication strategist. Her background's in broadcast and journalism. Um, she's also a social media influencer. She has something like 10,600 followers on Instagram. She has her own podcast and she does a lot of work around like female empowerment. She has a speaker's bureau. She's very accomplished. And lastly, Miriam golub is our, you know, tech behind the scenes, like programmer, digital strategist. Um, she has an amazing team as well that helps us doing all the programming of ads, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, let me think, YouTube, Google AdWords, and also LinkedIn. So like she's incredible, whether it's business to business or consumer. So one of the things about beverage marketing that I think it's kind of our ethos is we really believe that, um, you know, it's the way we got started. You know, so one day I was like working, doing, doing the daily grind. And finally, I'm like, why am I not doing this? Like, why am I not running the company? And so I do. And, and I know my team, we all really firmly believe we like to challenge entrepreneurs to say, why not me? Um, because we really believe it's like if you've been kind of doing things a long time, working for other people or you're just you're an out of the box thinker and you like problem solving and you know that it's not all glamour and glitz it's uh it's very rewarding being a business owner so we just want to encourage everyone today like a few housekeeping notes like feel free to take photos or screenshots of anything that resonates with you um, feel free to post online um, on your social media and so we've got our accounts here on the side and um feel free to ask questions along the way and participate in the chat. Sometimes it's a great way to like network and meet new people and other business owners and exchange ideas. So today the topic um, obviously is marketing B2C. So we're gonna talk about one, understanding your brand positioning within the marketplace, how to target your audience, plan your content strategy, implement that strategy and finally interpret success like what are the measurements and lastly we have a bonus with katie she's going to talk a really um because this is her specialty is social media content plays um using content marketing and we'll also share a couple like tools of the trade like uh, platforms and software that we find saves you money and gets the job done a little bit faster through automation and lastly um, I will send around after the fact, uh, just a, a, like a content calendar template that you can then go and insert your own content and start to plan your, your monthly strategies. So to start off, what is content marketing? Content marketing is a strategic marketing approach, focusing on creating and distributing valuable, relevant, consistent, is really important content to attract and retain a clearly defined audience. So you're not sort of what we call like spray and pray. We're much more of a targeted message to a specific type of um, buyer or user persona. 
and ensuring that we give them content that provides them value and is relevant in that moment at that time. So it's like the right message at the right time to the right person to hopefully drive awareness or whatever your goals are, depending on how new you are, or obviously like the goal is to get sales qualified leads and to um, ultimately drive profit to get them to purchase your products. So you want to bring them through a funnel. Content marketing is a lot more organic. And so it's actually a really, I'll get into it here. Um, it's a very uh, inexpensive way as a business owner to get uh, noticed. So content marketing, there's five reasons why we think it's important and why you should do it. It's, it's basically do it yourself a lot of the time, unless you're really not a confident writer or you know, you're still kind of crafting your voice. That's when often people call us is at the beginning, they were trying to launch and scale and they don't know how to like separate themselves from, from the pack, you know, like how do I stand out for my competitors? So, um, but once you have that voice or if you're really confident in your culture and you've done a solid business plan where you really know like what you're offering and what makes you special and different, um, whether it's price or how you, you know, how it's distributed online or, could be a million things. Um, that's that's really where content marketing starts to have value. Um, it helps you improve conversion rates. It allows you to connect and educate your customers or your leads. So, in the you know, when thinking about business to consumer, it could just be like even if it's something retail, like a pair of jeans. It's just you know, kind of presenting the the images of that clothing and you know, showing what makes your, your product unique or different in a, in an organic way that will attract their attention and maybe also educate them to realize, oh, this is something I want and like building trust with your customer. Um, content is amazing because it lives online forever. So it grows in value over time. So for example, you put a YouTube video up day one, you've got one, you know, one view day four, you have 24 views and who knows, the sky's the limit. You know, you've seen some, some videos go viral and there's 5 million people within like a matter of weeks looking at one video because it's just captures people's imagination or it's entertaining or whatever the reason. Um, brand, you know, doing content marketing allows you to build brand visibility. It helps you stand out from your competitors. Um, and, it's often it helps with search rankings because you're using keywords that help get you found online. So if someone's searching for something and the keyword comes up and it was in your video and you tagged it, or it was in your blog or in your social media post, they're more, more likely to find you than your competitor. And again, it's like, if you, if you're willing to put in the time, it doesn't necessarily cost that much. Um, lastly, content marketing can directly generate sales and or new leads, which is ultimately what we all want. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Actually, so, Elena, I have a, I have yeah. one question. Okay. Um, maybe kind of a dumb question, but um, how, how does, with, with a direct-to-consumer brand, um, mm -hmm. how does content marketing differ from kind of regular marketing where most of your efforts would be you know, kind of the way you just described content marketing would be, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. So one big difference is content marketing tends to be, you own the content. Um, okay. and you're not necessarily for the, for the most part, you're not paying for it. It's just your thoughts and your pictures and your, like, it's your, it's your personality showing through in content. So it's okay. not like you're going and buying an ad in, in a magazine and posting it. That would not right. be content marketing. Content marketing is a lot more organic than that. Okay. Katie just joined. Please join in at any time, Katie, if you feel like adding your two cents. Um, so for example, email marketing, like that's something you create internally and send out. You're not paying for, you know, an ad. So okay. you'll see here, like we don't have a lot of advertising only unless it's very organic type advertising where you're working with like a media company or a sponsor. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. So email, email marketing, surprisingly, and actually this year, we don't have like the latest, latest stats. I think it was 2018, 2019, but email has gone up. I heard, I think it was like at least one third in the last, since March, because everyone's at home they're having more time on their phone and like, 
just searching online for shopping and a lot more people have moved online for e-commerce, no surprise there. So yeah, email continues to be the main driver of customer retention. So retention meaning like loyalty, like they keep coming back to you and acquisition. So um, acquisition meaning you're attracting new leads and keeping them. 81% um, of uh, small to medium sized businesses still rely on email as their primary customer acquisition channel. And then 80% are using it for retention. So it's, the stats are there and they're only growing in numbers. Um, and people are, you know, used to getting an email once a week from their favorite brands. So I wouldn't shy away from email marketing at this stage, especially during COVID. 73% um, of respondents say they've made purchases as a result of viewing marketing content. So, and another 70% say um, they consider content marketing useful and valuable. It pushes them to further research the company, make a purchase. Um, they're more, you know, 64% are more likely to purchase a product after watching a video online. I am, so I put this example up here. I'm the perfect example. I'm pregnant right now. And I was like, you know, winter's coming and I'm like, I can't fit in any of my coats. And what did I do? I actually went to YouTube of all things. And I was just like searching like maternity jackets, coats, winter coats. And next thing you know, like all these videos came up of like bloggers and moms who had videos showing like the best jacket and why, and they were actually visually showing. Cause my other question was like, how does that work? Right. So I was looking for a video to show me like these inserts and all these clever things they have. I ended up buying a coat that after watching a video. So, and I'd never heard of the brand before. So I think videos have a lot of value and they live online for, you know, most people will watch videos up to four years later um, before they kind of get buried in the, the YouTube world. Elena, apologies for interrupting. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm here to summon you because our client that we were just meeting with needs a document sent from you. Oh, Great. gosh. Okay. Um, <laughs> document? They need the updated file. So uh, in the meantime, while you're doing that, I just thought I'd come on and say hi. Uh, bless you all for turning on your videos. Those of you who have, sometimes it just feels like you're talking to like a blank, uh, a blank slate. So it's great to great to meet with you. Has have we already done introductions, Elena? I know I missed the beginning. Uh, yeah, but maybe you want to talk a little bit about yourself. Okay, great. So I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about this. I was uh, scheduled to join later. I'm going to be coming on um, in the presentation uh, to talk a little bit about live streaming, um, as well as partnership giveaways from a social media perspective. So just to give you a quick background on me, uh, my name is Katie, and I uh, have my own marketing agency, and we do a lot of like brand consulting, um, as well as PR. And so I've joined and teamed up with Beverage Marketing to be helping with a number of the clients that they're working on over the next seven months. Uh, outside of that, I run a speakers bureau and I'm also a micro social media influencer. So I actually kind of approach influencer relations and digital marketing campaigns knowing both sides. I know what it's like to be on the side of the receiving end in terms of um, being an influencer who's been paid by brands to do various campaigns, whether it's been uh, photo only or video uh, related, and also on the other side of actually securing and working with, uh, with influencers. And so a little bit later in today's presentation, I'm going to be walking you through some of the pivots that I've been doing um, since COVID, which uh, has really centered on live streaming on Instagram. And I've seen some impressive results and uh, learned a lot from that experience and also some really great opportunities to kind of repurpose the content as well. Katie, I had a thought. If I share my screen, do you want to just keep going with the presentation? I apologize, everyone. Yeah, no problem. Okay. I could even do my section if you wanted. Yeah, sure. Wherever you look. I'd be curious to know though, um, sort of what the goals from, from everybody who's here today in terms of what you were hoping to take away um, related to content marketing, just so I could speak to any specific points. Well, that's a good point. Why don't, why don't we go around the room a quick, quickly and figure out what people want to learn? Oh, hi, it's Matthew. Um, 
I just basically wanted to learn the, you know, the content marketing and the difference between that and regular marketing, um, especially with regards to a direct to consumer brand. Um, my venture is, is a fashion brand. So um, just here to learn and kind of absorb, you know, some ideas and how to, how to move forward with this stuff. How new is your, is your fashion brand? Uh, it's new. I don't even have any product yet. Um, I'm still at, uh, I'm just about at the stage to get samples produced. Um, and I'm still just kind of wrapping up the business plan. And this is all going to help me kind of form the rest of my marketing plan and PR plan. So um, it's all pretty new still. Yeah, good for you. No, that's exciting. I, it's so funny because I had a call um, with someone the other week who, again, doesn't have a product, pre-product, but was kind of just doing some research and, and learning and getting into the industry, um, actually with an alcoholic beverage, which I know is quite a complicated sort of process. But they were sort of asking me, you know, what would be like one really great sort of tool or thing that I should be doing right now in order to prepare myself to have a successful launch? Um, and of course, you know, building your social media pages and, and doing your research and doing discovery calls um, with, uh, with potential uh, buyers and getting tons of feedback, the good, the bad, like pre-product, you want to soak in as much of that as you absolutely can. But the one thing that I said, even beyond those things is email subscribers, like that would be where I would be spending uh, a lot of time in terms of kind of getting, offering something, <laughs> some sort of freebie or some sort of pre-product discount or something like that to get people on an email list. Um, and I was just kind of describing how it's, it's similar to nowadays, even things like self-publishing a book, um, which I have also done. <laughs> um, it's, it really comes down that initial launch success comes down to kind of having people sort of already familiar with you, your brand and sort of ready to make a purchase. And so, yeah, I would spend a lot of time kind of, so this is great that you're here building content and something that you have to offer to kind of get brand recognition and getting people connected to you, not only on social media following, which is kind of like, yeah, it's good, but really having somebody who's subscribed to your emails, as Elena was just sharing with those statistics, like that is really where um, so much commerce opportunities, especially for that initial launch are coming. Um, so that's really helpful, uh, Matthew, to know just a little bit about you and where you're coming from. Thank you. Well, thank you, it's good. Okay, so I'm ready, sorry, <laughs> we're back. That's okay, did anybody else wanna quickly? Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, if you guys wanna keep going, cause I'm, I still gotta load up my screen here. Yeah. Let's see who do we got? We got Simon, we got Yusuf, we've got uh, Shanur. Hi, uh, hi, Katie. Hi. Hi, I'm, I'm based in the UK and I am starting up a business as a consultant in lean practices. So helping people, uh, helping businesses, uh, also helping uh, individuals through training so I'm just trying to get a feel for the difference between B2C and B2B. So that's, that's, that's my output for today. Okay, that's great. No, I think uh, uh, it's exciting to also have a B2B uh, joining us for this webinar because I think while many of the approaches um, are similar, I think I would argue that the places where you're gonna be needing to put your content when it is more B2B are a little bit different. Um, so some of like the main focuses primarily for you are probably going to be places like LinkedIn. I don't know how much you're um, on that platform or how much you've explored it, but like LinkedIn articles and groups, like there's so much that can be done kind of in that space. That's one, one area to, uh, to really own, as well as looking for, um, I guess, like publications or industry groups or things that are kind of related to your field of expertise where you could provide um, like a guest blog or a guest article or be a guest on a podcast. That's kind of like the direction where perhaps B2B makes most sense to sort of be pouring in your, your uh, content marketing. We can chat a lot more about that, but uh, it's, I think like the, the messages that Elena is gonna be sharing primarily today um, speak to both B2C, B2B. It's really about the channels that I would argue that uh, that would be different. Great. Okay, so we'll jump back in. So a couple more stats about why does content marketing matter? Um, 
especially if you're targeting a younger audience, 37.2 million um, people are now using TikTok as a perfect example. Like TikTok came out of nowhere <laughs> this year for me at least. And uh, that this was a 2019 stat. So rather impressive. You've got Gen Z and millennials now all using internet platforms and regardless of gender, they're all on social media. So I think even if you're looking like next generation, it's always important to keep in mind like, okay, I'm targeting an older demographic now, but the next group coming through the pipeline, the managers and stuff, if you're targeting management level, are going to be online as well, like on social media. So another important stat is that content marketing generates three times more leads than outbound marketing. So outbound is kind of that cold calling through, you know, an in-mail on LinkedIn or an in-mail, um, like a, just like a cold email to a potential customer. Um, and you've got six times higher conversion rates. So again, I think because content marketing is more organic, you're winning people's trust first and educating them, entertaining them, informing them. And then they're like, oh, wow, this is a cool brand. I want to invest um, my time and energy or buy, buy something from them. And lastly, it leads to eight times more web traffic. So when you're running content marketing, you can amplify it in all kinds of ways from social media to your email marketing, your blog on your website, using, you know, generating like um, organic traffic through like search, right? People are searching on Google for something and they, they come across your blog. So that's why it, it all of these things, you can um, now actually track it back, the traffic to your website and see like how many people actually clicked on that link that took them back to your website for more information. So one thing I wanted to kind of kick off is just a fun exercise, but you know, here you've got three types of brands of soap and really like soap is soap, but are you the type kind of person and you can either put this in the chat or just shout it out to buy the no name brand for $2.99 the Dawn Ultra $3.99 or Method Dish Soap at $4.99. Which one is the one you would buy? I'm, I'm attracted to the Method because of, of packaging and, and aesthetics, but I would buy the No Name. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. How about you, Simon? I, I would go No Name, and that's because I spent so many years in manufacturing <laughs> and watched the same thing just being rebranded, which is exactly the same. Yes. And for a more expensive price. Yes. Uh, I don't know if Yusuf is there, but feel free to write in the chat if, you, if you'd like. Let's see. Let's see, somebody wrote Dawn, known brand. Yeah. So this is really interesting. You've got a bit of a mix. I personally used to buy Method, so I was totally <laughs> falling into that trap. Um, and the reason why was because I lived in a condo and my kitchen was open to the living room where I like hosted people. Right. So I just, I always felt like everything in that room should be beautiful. It doesn't matter if it's soap or what, or a tea towel. Um, and also I liked, like, they have a really brilliant story behind them and they're, they tend to be more like uh, natural and clean for the environment. So for me, that was a draw. Um, Dawn, and I think someone said it's a more known brand, so it's trusted. Part of the reason why it's trusted is because of the story about, I think it was an Axon oil spill years ago, and they used Dawn soap to like clean the little ducks and everything that got caught in the oil spill. And, you know, it takes oil right out. So it, it works, right? So it's, it's the power of, you know, it, it works when you, you know, with like grime and, and oil. And then no name, it's for people that are like, you know, it's soap is soap. I'm not going to go spending a crazy amount of money um, and they don't really care about the label. So it, you know, I think it says a lot, but I think all of these brands, you know, they say they keep their promise, their brand promise. They are what they say. So, um, and that's part of the reason why you buy, you buy them because they align with your personal brand, like, like method aligned with my personal downtown hipster Toronto girl <laughs> vibe and someone who buys Dawn is like, you know, family values. And I just, you know, I want something that's, you know, helping the environment because I know they give back to, you know, for these spills and then no name is, you know, I'm very price conscious and I, you know, I, I'm not going to be fooled by 
fancy branding. So I think even when you're picking anything that you buy in a store, it's because of messaging and branding you've gotten from previous you know, experience with the brand. Does that line up with everyone? <laughs> Okay, so seven steps to a content marketing strategy. So at Beverage Marketing, we're very like process driven. So we always start off with what's your goal, you know, because content marketing is time consuming. So it's like, if you're going to do it, do it right. So tell me what your goal is. And so as a business owner, you have to ask yourself, like, what am I trying to achieve? Am I, do I want brand awareness? Do I need conversion right now? Like I need cash flow. I need to get sales in the door. Obviously everyone does all the time, but sometimes, um, you know, seasonally, you're like, okay, holiday is my time. Like, I've got to make these sales in the next three months. Um, you've got to research your competition. Obviously, you want to, if you're going to stand out from your competition, you have to know what they're saying or what they're doing. Um, and I'm a big fan of like not reinventing the wheel. So take what they do well and just try to do it better or look at the things they don't do well and try and find your little, you know, your your road to kind of stand out, whether it's your more innovative, more creative in your, in your messaging, um, your, the content you're doing is more like clever and relevant to the moment. Um, research per buyer persona. So you really want to know your audience and you want to have like a primary, a secondary and a tertiary audience where maybe there's like supplementary income coming in from that third party audience. Um, so primary is really like your main bread and butter, like who's buying my product, who, who wants my product. And obviously you're going to put most of your focus on them, but you may have supplementary content you're pumping out where you realize this person could influence the purchase. For example, we're working with an education brand and, um, you know, they know that moms are the primary decision maker, <clears throat> but there's definitely value in targeting children to go who are like going to their mom saying, please, I want to take the STEM minds course. Um, brainstorm content ideas. Obviously you've got to put some time into just brainstorming content, thinking seasonally, what's hot, like April, like what are people thinking about in business or what are they thinking about in terms of shopping in April versus December? Um, you want to create a work back schedule because one of the problems with content marketing is the consistency is really important. So if you kind of let it fall off your plate, it doesn't work and then you get frustrated. So, you know, one thing we always tell our clients is like, you got to put a year into this before you really start to see results. Like you're not going to get followers overnight on Instagram and you're not going to get sales overnight either. People have to see you consistently posting and over time that drives up loyalty and, and uh, new leads. You want to create a, sorry, then obviously we're going to implement content um, and our hint to you is start small. So maybe pick one or two channels um, like Instagram, Facebook, or for Simon, it would be Facebook, LinkedIn. It's just making sure that you're, you know, choosing the right channels and just start small, get the hang of it, get comfortable. And then you can always add in more after the fact. Um, and obviously you want to measure your results because that's obviously rewarding. It motivates you and it allows you to see what's working, what's not. Um, so typically like monthly, we'll stop and look at everything we're doing and be like, okay, what worked, what didn't. Um, and you can use, you can get so many analytics now, especially for online content marketing. So, and then the, the idea is to keep reiterating, um, based on the feedback, like from these, from this data, like find the insights and go, okay, people are responding to this, but not this. So you're obviously going to try and figure out that, that perfect sauce for your you know your perfect formula for your brand and like what works for you and put more money into that oops what's going on here okay so here's a quick um, business to consumer case study we thought we'd sort of start with something simple so wendy dennis she's a she was a very famous writer she was like a you know new york times bestseller you know back in the day and then she wanted to kind of rebrand, realizing that it's harder and harder to publish books. And she, so she became a ghostwriter and she started doing like pitch books. And that's obviously like a main source of her income. But 
there's like downtimes, right? Or like that's like these long projects and then they'd be like a break. So she decided she wanted another supplementary, like supplemental income. So she started writing toasts for people for weddings and even like eulogies for funerals because a lot of people don't know how to write sort of that touching, funny, perfect toast at a wedding. And she was doing it just for friends. And then gradually people were like, I'll pay you for this. So she realized there was an opportunity there and came to beverage marketing and wanted like an overhaul because her website hadn't been updated in a long time. And so we had to kind of work on her with that. So the first thing we asked her is define your goal. So she came back, she said, build a second stream of income. Here we talked about the wedding speeches, toast for members and the customers that like members of the wedding party, whether it's the mother-in-law or the mom, the dad, um, the best man. Um, and ultimately, like she wanted to get some notoriety because we knew there was a bit of a niche here and translate that to, hey, by the way, I also do legacy books and pick, pitch books. So just kind of like using it as a PR, oppor PR opportunity. Oops. So obviously you want to research your competitors. So we started looking at all the people in her industry. The main one was Oratory Lab at Laboratory in New York. They had a really cool website, pricing, everything was like sleek. And then there was like these one-off people who do like presentation skills and public speaking who are kind of cornering the wedding speech market where maybe they weren't writing the speech, but they were telling people like how to present, you know, how to be graceful on, you know, in front of a crowd. And so they were kind of cornering that market too. So then we looked at her audiences. So obviously her primary audience seemed to be mother of the bride. There was a lot of like moms and dads who are coming and saying, I don't, I've never really spoken in front of a crowd or, you know, I'm like, they're perfectionist and they're amazing at throwing a wedding, but then they don't know how to like deliver a speech. Um, and then a lot of them were kind of wealthier. So they were, I don't know, they were like doing a lot of destination weddings and quite fancy weddings. So they knew that like, you can't screw up a speech. Like after all that work, like you want to have like memorable speeches. So they were coming to her. Then you had, you know, Jared Butler. So he's just an example, you know, he's a older gentleman, father of the bride, lawyer, very self-aware. So he knows he's great at writing, like generally at reports and stuff, but he's not, not at delivering like a heartfelt speech for his son's wedding. And then finally you have Paul Chen. He's the best man, the brother of the groom. He's in his you know, late thirties, early forties. And he's just busy. Like he's got his own family. He doesn't have a ton of time to write a speech. And he's like, I'm not that funny, but I know like speeches should be like funny and interesting. And so he just, you know, he's the kind of person that would pay no problem for a speech. So the first thing we did is the website. Cause like ultimately content marketing, everything you're doing is driving traffic to your website where you have your main message. It's kind of like your, your, your business card online. Even if you're not doing direct sales through your website, like e-commerce, it's still important to have your message and show credibility and, um, you know, your unique point of difference. And even your photography can really change the way someone feels about your brand. So we did uh, portals because we knew like we had books for aspiring authors. We did for her speeches for special occasions. And then her whole journalism background was more just to kind of give her like, you know, street cred. <clears throat> and then we really tried to think of interesting ways to present her information. So like you have a big moment, uh, you feel the clock ticking, you have some thoughts, but you keep procrastinating. Like we just tried to make it kind of fun. And then she is, comes in as the stress reliever, the skilled listener, the experienced interviewer, the sounding board, the wordsmith and the fact, you know, the face saver. So it's, it's just really defining the problem and the solution in a fun, interesting way. And of course we had tons of testimonials to back up what she's doing because she's selling directly to the client. Um, question so far? Okay. So, Obviously the next thought was, you know, you're a writer, you should probably have some content like blogs to show your long form style. And if people resonate with your style, they're gonna, 
want to bring you on to write their speech. So we did, we had speeches about ghostwriting in general, where we knew like it would just get a lot of traffic because she, you know, she used the word Donald Trump and she analyzed some, you know, the writer who ghost wrote Donald Trump's book. And then um, she did anatomy of a great wedding speech. And from there we were like, oh, there's so much opportunity here for PR. Like we should take this on the road and like take this to producers and TV shows because like in the summer, as people are starting to think about wedding season, like this is a great kind of media play. So again, like you're always creating content with search words in mind and keywords and like what's topical and what's relevant at that time. But you're also thinking like, how can I then take this content and amplify it to other, you know, other channels, social media, PR, um, you know, can I make a video from this, whatever the, whatever the case might be. And just something to note, like typically 3% of each blog should contain, like those should be your keywords embedded. So you don't want to like overload it and it doesn't seem organic because Google's um, algorithms are super smart, but at the same time, different variations of one word pants, jeans, for example, um, whatever you're selling, you kind of want to try to use all the words that people might use to search. Um, amplify content on social media. So I just talked about this. You want to then take what you're doing on your website and on your blog and your e-blast and make sure that it's also resonating on um, like a social media channel. So Obviously writing is not a very visual event, but if you're a photographer, like by all means, you should be on Instagram. Um, if you're a videographer, you should definitely be on YouTube. Uh, and so we thought it'd be clever just to have like her like famous quotes and quotes that she loves from other people. And that even drove a little bit of traffic. It's just, I think being present is, is important, even if it's, you don't think that anyone's watching. She started using all the hashtags around like copywriting, writing, being a writer. She started to get a little bit of a community of people following her. This was in the early days, but, um, but I like this quote from her. And so we, even, even online, we brand her like on social media. One quick way to get coverage where you're kind of getting third party endorsement is by offering to guest like guest write a piece for a publication. So this is a really clever way to do content marketing because nowadays, especially there's no budget to pay writers. So if you come in and you pitch a writer, uh, which you can usually find through Twitter, like you find the editors of all the magazines on Twitter, um, you can find them through LinkedIn. Uh, you pitch them, you send them a note or like a direct email and you just say, hey, I'm an expert in this and this is what I can talk about and speak to. And here's an idea for a potential topic. Obviously you do your homework, you read their blog, make sure it's not been done before or their, you know, their website and then uh, offer to write something for them. And so she went in and you know, we knew destination was kind of an area where we attract that sort of higher end customer that has the, the funds to go and pay someone to write a speech. So we, we started targeting destination wedding magazines and like um, blogs and it worked. So she, you know, we, we basically pitched people's fear, which is like making mistakes in your wedding speech and what not to do. Then we took it on the road I pitched CBC, had a good contact there and just said, Hey, like this could be really funny for your like four o'clock in the afternoon. You know, it's like great, greater Toronto area. Um, in fact, I think it's Ontario, uh, TV, like radio station, but even with radio now she went in, she was like really upset because she, like I told her, but I think she forgot, but she, it basically, they're like, they took her photo. They did an article online. Then they did the recording, they posted the recording online. So everything was digital at the end of it. Like it wasn't just about the radio. It was the fact that now this, this article about her being on the radio talking about speeches for weddings is like viral. So it really like even doing a radio show can actually get you a lot of opportunity to then go and reshare that content to your own channels. The same thing she did a breakfast morning show called breakfast television and you know each time we tried to like spin it a little bit and like okay what are some funny wedding stories 
to kind of kick off and you want to ham it up when you're going on TV. You don't want to be like all business and here's my messaging, like nobody cares. But as long as you can kind of weave in your business and what you do and what you offer, um, but also make it like interesting. Um, she was kind of giving like worst case scenario wedding speeches, like things she'd witnessed in her life and then how she helps clients. So it was a really great play. Um, and actually what's interesting is with CBC, which is kind of like BBC in England, um, they, uh, they ended, she ended up getting a client for a pitch book, like a legacy book, which is one, one of those like six to eight month long um, projects, which is far more lucrative than writing a wedding speech. So the reason is because the interviewer is asking her like, oh, is this what you do full time? She goes, no, well, this is what I also do. So the guy heard that he liked her interview and next thing you know, she got a client out of it, which was a much, much bigger um, opportunity for her. So you want to measure your success. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to check how you rank on Google search. And here you can see like there's a ad, 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 and then where the arrow is cbc.ca meet the Toronto ghostwriter behind hundreds of wedding speeches. So when people search wedding speech ghostwriter, she's the first thing to come up. So it just kind of shows you the power of content and marketing <laughs> if you do it right. So we were pretty excited about that. Um, and not to toot my own horn, but I'm going to toot a little bit. <laughs> so basically, like we want to look at the results, like what came out of all this. So, you know, the best thing you can get at the end of all these things is a customer review on Google or um, get a, a client testimonial. So she wrote saying she expertly guided me through the branding and website development process, successfully pitched me to major media outlets and brought me several new clients. At the end of the day, that's what her goal was. I just want to get money in the pipeline, like clients in the pipeline. And she did like the following summer, she was packed. Like I called her and she couldn't even pick up the phone. She's like, I've gone on deadline for so many wedding speeches. So like all of that work, which at the time she's like, wow, there's so much involved. It's like, it, it was worth it. She, you know, now, now it's like trying to help her find time to do more content marketing. So the next thing I thought we would show you is more ways to leverage content marketing. So we're going to give you lots of different examples from all different clients that we've worked with. Questions so far, by the way? Okay. Yusuf, I think you're, um, if you could put yourself on mute, that would be really helpful. Thank you. So the next one is leverage brand partnerships. So this is one of, again, a free way to um, help you and someone else in your industry, maybe who doesn't conflict with you, but like you're, you are all in like a similar mission. So for example, we worked with um, a client called Hotel Doggy that sold outerwear like jackets and sweaters for dogs, mostly smaller dogs. Um, and, you know, we were looking for ways to kind of get fun new content. And some of the ways we did that was orchestrated a photo shoot at Hotel Le Germain in Toronto, which promotes itself as being dog friendly and boutique hotel and very chic. And Hotel Doggy's brand is very like, you know, they love hotels, they love film, and then, you know, the clothes themselves are functional, but not frou-frou and just kind of, it's a kind of a sophisticated dog brand. So, um, it just seemed like the right fit. So we contacted them and they're like, absolutely. We didn't even have to pay for anything. And they were delightful. We had a couple of meetings and scheduled it all and did like ran the whole brochure, like the catalog photo shoot. We did it in their hotel using different rooms. So we kind of showcased their rooms. Um, they were able to put the content online, which got them more views. And then we also used it for our for our catalog and then ran that and amplified it through social media. And of course a dog just with a coat on is cute, but putting a dog in like a really cool setting with a cool outfit that kind of, you know, it all aligns is even better. We also worked with Iggy Joey, which is a dog influencer, believe it or not. She has her own like blog. She has her own Instagram channel and she's super, super famous <laughs> and she's Canadian. And we kind of met her when she was up and coming so you call her like a micro influencer 
And um, her mom was like, yeah, let's do it. And her mom was a former writer as well. So we got her to write, guest write a blog for our blog um, to kind of drive traffic. And so we were both promoting it on each channel. Um, and then lastly, there, we worked with a, a, a animal kind of, it's an animal sanctuary essentially in King City in Ontario that has become quite famous. The owner is kind of looks like Posh Spice. She's rather beautiful. And she has this incredible like farm that she's converted into a sanctuary for farm animals, but mostly dogs. And so they had brought a whole bunch of dogs back from China and we had already done like a shoot with them for another catalog in, in a different year. And then we realized that, hey, we could probably help you get your dogs adopted faster if we shot them like professionally with the little sweaters on to really make them all stand out. And they were totally down for it. So we put this on social media and it went viral and we had blogs about it. And, um, you know, animal rights is another area where we knew like people are really strong minded about it. And it just seemed like the perfect fit. So another example of how to leverage your brand partnerships. Um, encourage content collaborations with influencers. Katie will talk more about this, but even with a restaurant, and this is pre-COVID, we, we had like a breakfast program with a restaurant that had just launched. And we were looking for new ways of getting interesting content. And we invited a whole bunch of influencers to come and it was unpaid. It was like, hey, we'll provide you breakfast. And I mean like gourmet breakfast for you and like three friends. And, you know, everybody come in and we'll do like a takeover of the restaurant, like Instagram takeover and let you guys shoot the food and try it and talk about it and rate it and all that. So they ended up all coming in and we got like the most amazing like Snapchat type content that things we wouldn't even predict, like be able to do ourselves or think of. But because they're young, they ended up bringing other influencers with them because they're all friends anyway. And they came down, they're all foodies and they all just took over. And we ended up having to like cook them another breakfast because it was the one that, you know, you, they shot and then it was all cold and then we had to go and feed them actually. But um, this just shows you like, sometimes it's best to just work with influencers in that space who can take things so much further than you can picture in your own head. Um, and this type of stuff went viral when they were using like these, you know, Snapchat filters and things like that. We did a union station, all their outdoor programming and events, and it's direct to consumer. We're trying to get people who live in Toronto to come out to their live food festival. And it was like, I think 10 to 20 vendors and you get like a little passport and you can go around and and try all this different types of food and it was outside and it was beautiful. This is again, pre COVID, but we decided to incorporate a couple paid plays, but again, thinking organically about how can we make the content seem natural and not so like pay for play. So obviously we branded the, we took over like one of the pages of a famous um, blog site where it's kind of everything you need to know about Toronto. It's called blog to and it has a really, big following, you know, with e-newsletters going into people's inboxes every day. And one of the things we thought of is like, hey, we don't need to be like the article, like a paid article, but why don't we be part of a list? Because they do a lot of lists, like top festivals, top things to do winter and summer. So we were fine with that as long as we could kind of do a page takeover. Um, and that went over very, very well. We also partnered with a radio station called Indy 88 um, and we did like contest giveaways. So we were giving away, we were, we were creating like packages um, working with different vendors to create like a $500 package for someone to win. And again, it wasn't really a paid play. It was uh, just giveaways. Um, so yeah, sometimes when you're working with media and you are buying ads, you can say, okay, what else can you do for me that I don't have to like pay for, but I can you know, um, get more eyeballs or more traffic. So one of the things they offered too is, hey, we have a street team. Can we come down one or two days and like be on site running the radio show? And we're like, absolutely. Or like, can we have our guys there handing out free tchotchkes from Indy 88? So again, it was, it was a really great play because they're kind of considered the, the cool hip radio station in Toronto or like a hipster. 
here's an example of user generated content. So I was thinking of Matthew for this. Um, if you are going to fashion or beauty or any of those types of products, one of the best things you can do is invite your consumer to generate content for you. Give them a hashtag, give them a challenge, um, tell them like, you know, take a photo of you in our makeup or in the, in our outfit and, you know, like use this hashtag and like, show us what you've got, you know, and people love to like share with with the brands like how they've taken your clothing and sort of innovated it or elevated it with their makeup and their hair and their styling so i i used to work on bite beauty we helped launch it and it got acquired by sephora but it was like a little canadian lipstick brand like manufactured in toronto and um had a lot of really unique um selling points because it was like natural highly pigmented not typical of lipstick um, that's natural and very, very moisturizing. And so it was an easy sell with the training team, like all these teams selling it at Sephora. But the next level is to get your consumers to love you as much as you do, like as you love the product. Um, so this was kind of one of the plays they did where they had style with Bite and people just started posting pictures of themselves, like doing their makeup or how they're using Bite and how they're styling themselves. And of course they host this on their website. So you can always go and see if your, your picture made it on. Back to Hotel Doggy, one of the clever things they do is they've created a link tree site where it points to all the shop, like all the places you can shop for Hotel Doggy. So right from Instagram, you're like, oh, that's so cute. You can then go and like see which stores it's sold at. You can look at the size guide. You can go to the website. You can go to the blog. And it's all from Instagram. And Linktree, again, is one of those just like basic hosting platforms for, for content. Elaine, I ask a question about Linktree. Um, it, I have a, another, another company that I'm running right now, and I... I find because because you're only allowed the one web link with Instagram, um, it seemed to make more sense to me to link to my actual website, where I can then direct people to, you know, different areas of my site, and, and then from there, you know, they can link to products. Because um, I, I found that Linktree doesn't seem to be very brand friendly. In yeah, a lot of cases. yeah, it's very plain. So yeah, I think it just depends on, again, like what, how your site's set up. If it's set up for e-commerce and you really want people to shop directly on your site, then go for it. Hotel Doggy is actually, they're more concerned about making sure their wholesalers or their distributors are happy. Right. So they're not interested. They don't really do shop, like Shopify or anything on their own site. It's right. very, very basic. They actually are trying to move people to Hudson's Bay or wherever, Ren's Pets. Um, but that's a valid question. I mean, and, and one thing I like to do is change the link once in a while, like if I have a new blog, so it kind of keeps, again, it's like a living, breathing thing, even your bio. Um, I definitely would let Katie speak to that one. Okay. And of course you want to ent entertain and inform people through social media. Most people go on, especially on Instagram or like Facebook, they just want to be entertained. They're not necessarily there for like hard information. So keep that in mind. Uh, the 80 20 rule states that, you know, 80% of your social media posts should inform, educate, entertain your audience. Only 20% should direct, like directly promote your business. And with, by doing that, you will actually increase your following. If you over promote, you'll see you're going to lose followers very quickly. So this is a nonprofit play because um, we've had people on our call before who, who have like work within nonprofits or starting nonprofits and they're going direct to consumer. So we just wanted to give them like one or two slides, but basically treat your customer, even if you're a nonprofit, like any other consumer, like someone buying a Nike, you know, Nike shoes, even if you're a nonprofit, because it's like, they're still looking for value. Um, and I think that's really important to note. So we try to provide, we worked with um, South Lake Foundation and they're a major hospital in like outside of Toronto and they serve a lot of areas. So we partnered with a major like health food store 
which is a sponsor and said, Hey, how can like, we want to leverage you online this year. We've had to pivot our whole like outdoor run, big event online. And so we had them create these little like snackable content videos where there was like a nutritionist health ambassador. She's kind of got a little following on um, online and on social and had her do like unveiling of what you get in your kit for the run. Cause you're going to now going to do it by yourself at home or with your family. And then she also did like, uh, here's how to make an awesome smoothie using products from nature's emporium, by the way, some of these products are in your race kit, that kind of thing. So it was just trying to leverage sponsors to give them some love, but also to give our, our audience something really unique that maybe other nonprofits don't do. And here you see, we did at the end, um, we really tried to take the pictures that people submitted online of them doing the, the run or the walk or however they wanted to do the distance um, and share it like, kind of like you're part of our community now. We so appreciate what you've done. Like, you know, and just taking all the Instagrams and trying to make a fun collage. And what's interesting here too is 49% of consumers say they would like to receive promotional emails from their favorite brands on a weekly basis. So, so there are days when I get annoyed when I get like Lowe's and I get Wayfair and I get like, cause I just moved recently and, and I'm like, oh, there's so many emails. But to be honest, I do open a lot of them, especially if there's some special discount because it's members only. So I think using email to give people behind the scenes, um, discounts, special offers, limited time only, uh, you know, reserve first, those types of things, it can really go a long way. And within fashion, Matthew, uh, like I have a whole, I used to teach fashion PR at uh, Yorkville University, but you know, partnerships are huge. Like working with another well-known artist or designer to create a limited edition line is like the go-to thing that pretty much every brand does now, whether it's fashion or beauty. So limited time only is like a really something to consider when you're working within the design space. Um, where there's like a limited number of products to sell like shoes or whatever. Um, something else to note, sorry, I just pulling it because I can see it's covering my the text. Um, yeah, so the average, this is another interesting stat, the average open rate for a welcome email. So, hey, you've just given us your email through Instagram and then you wanna welcome them and just kind of give them an overview of who you are or give them a special discount on their next purchase, that the average open rate is 82%. So really that first email can do a lot for re retention because um, after that, you'll notice a huge drop off. You know, you're talking like 21% open rate is good in consumer, the consumer world. Mm -hmm. And then never mind your click through rate is probably like two and a half percent, three percent. So, okay, so here we say above all, entertain. And you can do that through surveys, polls, live QA, ask me anything. I'm the designer. Um, feature the bizarre, the weird. People love that. I mean, look at Elon Musk, he's made a whole career of it. Cause related um, is always you know, can't really go wrong when there's like a cause, you know, don't, you know, you buy this, we'll give this amount of money to such and such charity. Um, strategic partnerships, we mentioned gifting. So you can send gifts to famous people and hope that they'll wear it and take a picture. And we've, we've had some success actually, even with the dog sweaters, we sent it to famous people at TIFF festival, film festival. And then their dogs were like, they would take a video or a shot of their dog in the sweater and send it to us. So all of a sudden we're like, oh, Jessica Chastain or, you know, Anna Lee Tipton. It's like pretty good, you know? So it's a bit of a risk because you're sending product and you don't know what's going to happen. But, um, you know, those are things to think about. And lastly, interviews, um, which I think Katie will speak to more. And so here you've got, we've got, we've outfitted a dog who um, from a famous blogger in Toronto, Do the Daniel, was his blog. And he had like this giant dog. So we thought it'd be kind of funny to like 
try and squeeze them into like a sweater. And then the, the next one with this sort of older dog, it was like an adopt the dog sh TV show on Marilyn Dennis, which is a women's morning show that airs nationally. I just went and met with her. I opened my suitcase of clothes. I'm like, she, I know she loves pets and animals, one of the producers. And so basically I just said like, whatever you want, we will send. And they did a show about that. And then people, we sent product to People Magazine and they have an offshoot called People Pets. And we sent them some information about like fall, what's hot for fall for dogs. And we picked our most sort of outrageous outfits. And again, we got some coverage there. And the last example is Purina Paws Way was like a charitable thing where they train, you know, it's owned by Purina, the dog food brand, but then they train dogs at this center down on the waterfront in Toronto. And so we actually did like a full fashion show with 93.5 flow FM, like hosting, like she was the radio announcer. And we did like, we paired the outfits with the owners and the dogs and turned it into like a whole thing. So there's, you know, if you can kind of think outside the box and you have some budget to play with, you can really get creative. So last of all, you want to measure your success. Um, so you're going to look at traffic coming in from Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, wherever, YouTube, um, and you're going to make changes as you see things working, not working. You're going to evaluate conversions. So is your content, um, like which of your content's getting more eyeballs? You can check all of this through like Google Analytics on the back end of your website. Um, you can also just look at your sales. If your sales are not going up, then maybe there's something wrong with your content marketing. Um, and click throughs, like email blasts, it always shows you like if you have a click here to shop or shop now, you'll be able to see right away if there's conversion. Um, you can track engagement. So engagement's more important in a lot of ways than just following your brand or liking your brand. It's somebody who actually comments or shares a post. And you want to evaluate the content, like the actual reaction. Was it positive or negative? Because sometimes you don't always get positive feedback on, on social media. Um, and then you want to check your, your SEO ranking. Uh, SEO means search engine optimization. It just means like you're ranking on Google. Um, and there's actually like a, like a, what's the word, like a rating that gets assigned to your website based on how well you're creating content and, you know, what you're doing. So it's helpful to work with a consultant that can tell you, okay, this is the health of your website. You've got, you know, 72%. We want to get you to 94%. How are we going to do that? And they'll go back through all your blogs and just make sure that they're SEO friendly on the back end with the links and tags and categories, um, things that are a little bit technical, but can really help get you more, more eyeballs. Um, and last, oops, sorry. Last of all, you wanna look at monitoring authority. So this is again, that score you get from one to a hundred and the higher the score, the greater your online authority is. And so that will improve your ranking on Google. Questions? Okay, well, we're gonna get to the fun stuff. <laughs> Katie's next. Your part's fun. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all business. So uh, bonus presentation. So first we have social media content marketing plays with social media guru, Katie Zepieri. <laughs> and then we're going to talk about tools of the trades to help save you big. And um, I'll then add the free takeaway in your chat. So Katie, okay. take it away. Yeah, I wanted to start actually by addressing um, Matthew's question. Uh, about the link tree. Um, so Matthew, how often are you using Instagram or Facebook? Um, I mean, I, I use it personally a lot. Um, I have a, my secondary business right now is, you know, it's kind of a part-time thing. Um, so I use Instagram a lot for that. Um, that's kind of what I was referencing with the link tree thing where, you know, I have some products on a third party site that I've created. Um, and rather than just have that third party site in a link tree list, um, I want to showcase some more, you know, photos of the products on my website and then link to the products from there. Right. Um, just I thought, you know, if I direct people to my website instead, they can see, they can read more about me and, you know, I get more information and, and that and actually it's all kind of, 
you know, it's my brand, right? So you get that as, as an impact when you first click the link as opposed to just a list of links, you know what I mean? Absolutely, yeah. No, I think uh, in some circumstances, perhaps such as your own, it maybe makes sense to just drive to the website because really your goal is is e-commerce. Um, right. So, you know, it's not necessarily like you're going to want them to read a blog more than you're going to want them to purchase. Right. And you kind of want them to get the whole sort of view. But I was yeah. going to mention to you, and perhaps you already have it with your um, your other business, the shop feature on Facebook and Instagram. Right. Um, this is something that uh, even um, a company called Later, uh, they're like a social media scheduling uh, platform, just actually released um, an update of what they are anticipating for 2021 social media trends. It's a really good article. So just even like Google Later and, and kind of 2021 trends, uh, which kind of outlines what's up and coming. And one of the areas that they've mentioned is this idea of shop. Um, and now I see it, I have multiple Instagram accounts. I have my own, um, you know, personal brand. And then I have my two business accounts as well. And we, we have registered them all as like business accounts. And I have a shop tab personally for my page because I have my two books for sale there. And Instagram has almost like completely reformatted the platform to be pushing e-commerce sales. Like it's really remarkable. Now at the bottom of my screen, like the shop tab is one of the options. Right. And you options is the shop tab. So even connecting your, um, especially like as a fashion brand, it's like a must have because right. every time you're posting images of, of people wearing your clothing, you tag it and people can directly shop like through Instagram or through Facebook. Right, right. Um, yeah, I, I, I've seen that feature on, on other brands that I follow. Um, I haven't explored it yet for the one business because it's not, I'm not really pushing too much product, um, but definitely when I when I launch the, the fashion brand, it'll I'll take advantage of that for sure. You yeah, know, do my research on it and kind of figure it out. I haven't looked into it much yet, but definitely um, thanks for the the tip because I'll definitely you know look at that. Yeah, and it wasn't too hard to set up. Like I am using WordPress, so you were I was able to like connect them, right? Uh, and yeah. you kind of do it through Facebook, and then it automatically attaches to to Instagram as well. Uh, okay. But yeah, I actually think that link in bio in many cases, especially for like a direct to consumer e-commerce brand, I think in many ways, like people don't even necessarily go to the link in bio as often now, because when I'm shopping on like a, a brand's uh, page that I like, and I'm like, oh, wow, I want that specific shirt. It's easy for me to just like click shoppable product type thing. And um, I think that's going to be an increasing trend that we're going to see across all social media platforms. It's even coming to TikTok and um, right. other spaces as well. So yeah, just, uh, just something to think about. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, I've got, I think a couple slides here to talk about some additional points of consideration, um, as we're chatting about content marketing. Um, so social media giveaways, of course, the obvious, you know, focus there is B2C, but there are opportunities to do this B2B as well. Um, essentially, my personal experience, both like as running a marketing agency, also like just being a person who has a personal brand or at one point I was building like a girl empowerment conference and was really trying to build that brand. I've really utilized and leveraged working with key influencers and it can be influencers in like the traditional, we think of like the Instagram, you know, star that you kind of partner with, but it's also just like thought leaders or experts or people who, who have cred in a particular industry. And by attaching your product or your services or some sort of offering to that person really has helped me um, like elevate and uh, is helping so many brands elevate and kind of hit the right audience with the right message. Um, it's also a really great way to increase your followers and gain impressions. Um, so it's like, for instance, and I'm gonna share this Matthew because I'll get hit up by fashion brands. You know, there's a right way and there's a wrong way to do it um, often. And sometimes 
actually oftentimes it's a very generic like message that you get sent. Hello, <laughs> you know, we think you have a nice page. We'd like to send you something. Um, and it's like not customized to the, to me, let alone like why they think it's a very good like brand alignment and brand fit. And so giveaways and partnerships with influencers are a waste unless it makes absolute sense that the person that you're connecting with like speaks speaks to the audience that you're trying to to reach so um for instance this is one time where um you know it was a great partnership with a brand i recently partnered with paris jewelers um canadian jewelry company to do a giveaway of the gold hoop earrings that i'm wearing in this photo um so there was a few things of why this was the right fit one i host an instagram live show weekly uh, i'm going to chat about that a little bit more but um I'm interviewing high profile women on that. So again, jewelry target female audience makes sense for them to, to perhaps partner with me. And our partnership included sponsorship of six episodes of, um, of my Instagram live show, as well as a feed post here where I actually was wearing the earrings, wearing the product. And then there was a swipe through image where you could actually see uh, the product up close and people in order to enter the contest had to like, had to comment, and um, had to follow both myself and Paris Jewelers. And we give bonus, um, bonus entries if they tag additional people. So sometimes you have people like tagging, you know, 50 people, 50 friends in that, which therefore encourages more engagement and more likes and more follows. Um, we also gave a bonus I think five entries that people shared this post in their stories. So it's again, it's just like, how can you take like one moment, one giveaway, one partnership and help expand the reach as much as possible, getting people to share it on as many platforms. And uh, yeah, we've seen really great success um, with this giveaway, you know, um, I think like well over like a hundred followers from that and, um, and lots of comments and engagement for both me as well as for, as for Paris Jewelers. Them through. Um, so I want to chat a little bit about live streaming just because it's something that I found um, to be very beneficial. Um, and I think there's more and more opportunities for live streaming. And whether this is a podcast, which I launched in 2020, whether this is uh, social media lives. Um, so again, Instagram live has really taken off um, since COVID-19, especially. Um, Facebook Live has always been a thing. I don't personally use that one as much, but for some brands, it absolutely makes sense to do that. Um, LinkedIn Live, I've learned recently that this is a possibility, which like Simon is maybe speaking a little bit more to you with B2B. Uh, it's something that I'm very excited about and actually going to be looking at for 2021. You can't stream directly on the platform natively. You have to use like a third party streaming service and kind of broadcast it over. But I've seen a few brands that I follow on LinkedIn that are more B2B do a very good job of creating like a weekly or a monthly series. Um, and it's a great way to showcase your expertise, whether it's just you kind of coming on camera talking about your product um, or your service, or whether you're interviewing somebody who's related to um, your industry to kind of add additional value to people and why they might want to watch. Or say in, in Matthew's case, you know, if you're, um, if you're trying to promote your, your fashion brand, like, yeah, it could be you jumping on. You could also be, it could be a partnership that you do with key influencers, where in addition to them, like posting on their pages, they also could do a takeover on your page um, and, and like a live stream, you know, showing off a new product, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the reason why I'm excited about live stream, to be completely honest, <laughs> is because like I have a background in radio and television broadcasting. And previously, it always felt like such an effort to like get a really awesome interview with somebody, you know, I'm thinking back to it's like, okay, you have to have a camera set up, like come to you. Um, you'd have to book a location, a beautiful studio. Um, there's all the miking requirements, everything's got to be perfect. And that can be like extremely overwhelming, not to mention, you know, cost um, heavy. And so live streaming is exciting to me because the barrier to entry is lower. Um, there's 
like, of course, you don't want your live stream to be terrible quality. There's little things that you can do, but for the most part, it's not too major. You get one of the, I've got it behind me, like a ring light. Um, you know, if you want to have like a mic, like either attached to you or in front of you, just a couple helpful things. It's really, um, you know, doesn't take much to kind of set it up. And what I've been loving is that the Instagram lives or any of these lives there, they can be recorded, they can be reposted. So you're not only getting like the live viewer audience, but you're getting additional views and people checking in later. And then, and we can skip ahead, Elena, the really amazing thing is that you can actually like repurpose um, the content. So just to give you an idea of how I've used live streaming over the past few months, when, when COVID hit as uh, someone who's like a, a speaker and was was largely doing event management, um, you know, prior to that, it was like, okay, what the heck am I going to be doing now? How do I kind of pivot and change up my offerings? And so, um, yeah, I also noticed that like people's um, morale was low and uh, people were struggling at the start of COVID just with worrying about what's up and coming. And so I had this, you know, thought, what about if I kind of created a daily Instagram live uh, show and I would pop on and I would have an interview um, with a guest and um, and we chat for maybe like a half an hour and talk about how they were um, being resilient and practicing resilience during this difficult time and also how they've overcome obstacles in the past. So I called it Together We Rise. Um, it really came together in like three days because again, it's me for the most part, just like setting my phone on a stand. I ordered a background that like pink wall from Amazon for like $16, um, you know, and, uh, and I started to reach out to my network to book guests. So I was able to do 83 interviews um, over 13 weeks. It was like it was like running a show um, and I was able to actually get uh, two different brand partnerships. We had one main sponsor throughout the series, a company called First Session. Um, and then uh, we also did a partnership with, with Paris Jewelers. Um, so brands kind of came in for that. And in total, um, we were able to get quite a few um, views and tons of engagement because for instance, when you go live with somebody on social media, this is why, like, why did maybe I choose this over like doing like Zoom and recording and then putting it up. When you go live with someone on social media, not only are your followers being notified that you're going live, but so are the person that you're interviewing or going, going live with, their followers are being notified that they're going live, which means that, you know, I'm, I have a very small sort of community, which means that when I'm interviewing somebody who has a very large following, it's reaching so many more people. So it's a really great way to like, again, just by partnering with a like-minded influencer, Influencer or interviewing them, offering value to them, like a great interview opportunity, you're helping build your own profile. You're helping to build your own um, reach as well. So this actually was a still from my interview with uh, Rachel uh, Abasolo, and she um, was the first Black female bachelorette on, on the show, the hit ABC show, uh, Bachelorette. So I was able to get some incredible guests, including like a Canadian minister, uh, journalist. Like I really was able to get some incredibly inspiring people uh, like Rachel to join me for this live interview. And so what we did is we decided to repurpose the content. Now you've got this great live stream and you've got it recorded. How can you, you know, use that and create more bite-sized content? One thing that's going to be a big trend for 2021 is short form content. Um, and we're seeing this explode. Um, again, I feel like COVID has just like accelerated so many things. It's accelerated e-commerce. Um, it's accelerated um, TikTok and many different channels on social media, like people and brands who were never using it before um, are now using it. And before I was like, oh, it's just dancing videos. It's just this, but it's so much more than that. I'm seeing people um, use TikTok to create really creative bite-sized content that is easily consumable because more and more people are not sitting or they're being very selective about what they're sitting um, to watch for like 10 minutes, five minutes even. Um, they want something that's quick and Instagram has responded to this by creating reels. So it's now, you know, 15 second or 30 second short little videos. So you could take a longer form um, like live stream and this is really the strategy of content marketing is you kind of have your pillar like anchor pieces, your big longer form content. So it could be something like um, 
an interview, a video interview. It could be something like a podcast or um, a main blog article could be any of these sorts of like bigger, you spend a lot of time on it. Um, you know, you're kind of investing a little bit more of your time and energy into creating this. And then you take that and you create smaller pieces of content from it. So whether it's like, I can make quotable images from this interview that I had, I could cut up the video into smaller um, 30 second, one minute clips and, and repurpose that and post it on the various platforms. So as you can see, I took a, hor a, a vertical Instagram live and um, I had a co-producer who I was working with who has um, some great editing talents and she actually was able to cut the video up and put it in into side by side um, format like this in a horizontal so this went up on YouTube this went up on LinkedIn again just making things more shareable and, and, and engaging great thank you Katie any questions from the, the group? No? Uh, nope. No, I'm okay. Okay, so we're basically at our last slide here. Um, we just want to give you some ideas of tools of the trade. So just taking advantage of inexpensive tools for content marketing. So one of the things obviously we talked a lot about social media. So having a social media planning platform can be very useful. Um, we're big fans of Hootsuite if you're doing like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Instagram. If you're just doing Instagram, um, later is kind of good because it allows you to see like six tiles of images, like how it would look on your phone, for example, um, and then show it to somebody else on your team or edit and write it all and then publish it. So um, Asana, Monday.com, Trello, those are more like organizational tasks. Um, I was just looking yesterday at monday.com kind of has like an online calendar so you can go in and share it with multiple people um and it's just it's something that lives in the cloud so it's like easy to edit and update and just put in your content for the year um and 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 multiple different types of content and also kind of track and notes and tasks and things like that for people um Obviously for researching your competitors, Google alerts are great. If you wanna just keep tabs on your industry, just set up Google news alerts. Um, so I have all different ones, depending on my clients, like from risk engineering to dog fashion, you know, um, live streaming, Zoom uh, first. Okay, so for live streaming um, and webinars, like we're doing, or, uh, you know, like live stream, like Katie's mentioned on Instagram, obviously, Instagram seems to be like the hot new one. Facebook, I've got certain clients uh, that prefer that one. LinkedIn Live. So now you can actually post stories on LinkedIn. Um, so that's important to note. Um, for video editing and hosting, I, I know a lot of people already have iMovie on their Mac. It's not that difficult to use. I've sort of played around with it. I prefer personally to outsource video editing, but um, and I use Fiverr, which has all kinds of um, freelancers from around the world, you know, and they're working in different currencies, which might be more affordable for you. And you can just put your bid out there and let them come back to you with their best rate and what they can do for you. And you can see a little bit of their portfolio. Um, Vidyard allows you to host videos and so does Vimeo. So like oftentimes videos weigh down websites, they weigh, or you can use YouTube as well. So basically you want to make sure that people are linking to something maybe off of your website if it's like a heavy file. Um, and Vidyard's cool because you can actually see like who downloaded it, how long did they spend on it, and you can get a little bit more analytics. And Vimeo is like a straight up hosting site. Um, and there is a fee after a certain point for each of them. And lastly, Canva. So I used Canva to design this presentation. Um, now you can actually host your webinar, like or your, your PowerPoint right on Canva, which I just realized yesterday. Um, and the pro account, if you upgrade, has tons of stock imagery, which can be very, very costly to get. And you always risk a little bit if you go on Google Images because you might be using copyright or, you know, you get your photo up and you realize there's like a, a watermark on it. <laughs> it. Never looks good, does not look professional. Um, things like that. They have stock video now, they have GIFs, 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 and all kinds of things. So lots of animated um, tricks there. And so 
Yeah, we will um, shortly after upload our free takeaway of the um, calendar template, content calendar template. And just a final thought, <laughs> I love this. This was actually an animation, if anybody remembers this guy. But content marketing is really like a first date. If all you do is talk about yourself, there won't be a second date. I think that's like, he's like one of those media heavy um, producers, storytellers in the industry. Um, he's won like Cannes film, um, you know, content awards, David Beebe. But this is so true to me. It's like a lot of people just go online thinking post and ghost and promote yourself, but that's not really what people want or are looking for nowadays. And if there's anything we want you to take away, it's that. <laughs> so this is the team to help you get there. If you're stuck on, you know, strategy or you just want that sort of takeoff, um, you know, where do I start? We're definitely open to conversation. We also provide like a 45 minute free consultation for anyone that's interested, just if you want to bounce ideas off of, so you're not kind of wasting time or money or energy going in the wrong direction when you kick off and, um, that's about it. Thanks for everyone for joining us today. And um, this is our contact information if you want to get in touch with me or Katie. And open to chatting after this, um, this talk. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to turn off the recording. And if anybody wants to stay after and chat for a bit, we're more than happy to.